it is time for Play It Forward. And take it away. Welcome. I'm Allison, and you are listening to Play It Forward on WUSB, Stony Brook 90.1 and 107.3 FM. So alongside me are my co-hosts and fellow advocates of Play It Forward, the remarkable Kurt Taylor and (laughs) Kurt Hall and Taylor Solomon. And we have Serena Harris and Sanjana Iyer, our new members of the team. So happy that you guys are here. Um, Momentarily, we will introduce our guest here in the studio, Kim Lauby, Executive Director of Hugs. But before we begin our interview with Kim, I'd like to make an announcement. On behalf of the Sunshine Prevention Center and Dr. Carol Carter, mark your calendars for Sunshine Prevention Center's Fall Family Festival on October 14th from 10 to 3 p.m. The rain date is October 15th. It's located at 468 Boyle Road in Port Jeff Station. Not only you will have fun participating in fun family and children's activities, but there will also be sports memorabilia, craft vendors, and business and agency resources, but you will also be supporting the important work that Sunshine does with youth and families as a nonprofit organization. So again, October 14th from 10 to 3 in Port Jeff Station. For more information, check out sunshinepreventioncenter.org. So let's pass the mic to Taylor for a closer look at what Play It Forward is all about. Hey listeners, the Play It Forward project is not your typical nonprofit. Our mission is to shine a light on the world of fentanyl, opioids, and elusive substances, and our goal is to empower students and communities with wisdom for a safer and brighter future. We're diving into drug knowledge, promoting prevention, and sharing evidence-based strategies. We stand with those in recovery, offering unwavering support and vital resources. Join us on Instagram at sbu.playitforward and find dynamic content on our YouTube at The Play It Forward Project. Be part of something bigger. We broadcast from Stony Brook University's radio station every other Friday, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Here's Kurt with some essential insights about fentanyl. Good afternoon, everybody. Fentanyl is a highly potent synthetic opioid that is 30 to 50 times stronger than heroin. As little as two milligrams of fentanyl has been killing many people every day. Here's a visual. Picture a penny. The amount that will fit on Abraham Lincoln's nose is enough to kill one person. This deadly opioid kills one person on average every every 11 minutes, making it the leading cause of death for adults ages 18 to 45. Fentanyl's devastating toll claims over 200 lives each day. This heart-wrenching reality is similar to a commercial plane crashing every single day. Without further ado, here's Allison to introduce our guest. Thanks, Kurt. So, with me in the studio is the amazing Kim Lauby mm. of Hugs. Welcome, uh, Kim. Executive Director. Welcome to the show, Kim. I'm a warm welcome to you on behalf of Play It Forward. We're very happy that you're here and we're very honored to have you here. You're an amazing person. Uh, So Kim, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about about yourself? Awesome. So first of all, thank you for having me here. And I am sitting amongst amazing people. So that's kind of the way that's how this works, (laughs) right? And so, uh, so my name is Kim Lauby, and I run an organization called Hugs. And there's a a long way that I got to become the executive director, but it speaks really to the power of prevention. Hugs has been around since the 80s. It is um, based and grounded in positive youth development, drug and alcohol prevention, and really how do we teach emotional health? And not just to young people. How do we do this for Mm. families? How do we do this for communities? And it's really about not using just like, let's go in and talk to people about the dangers about substances. It's really about giving tools for life. How do we positively cope with life and deal with all of our challenges, whether you identify as somebody who is at risk or not at risk? We all could use a little, uh, take an area of any one of our lives and level up just Mm -hmm. a little bit more, right? Yeah, yeah, well, that's awesome. Um, And we're very happy to have you on here. Um, Sorry, I just lost my page here. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, no, the the work that you do is amazing. So you want me to deep talk? But yeah, go a little bit deeper for us. Let me tell you how I got here, because that's always like kind of my favorite way to tell uh, to introduce the power of this program and what it was. I didn't grow up saying, oh, I want to do drug and alcohol prevention when I get older um, (laughs) or be a public speaker or, or travel this country and do this work. I actually 
sit here today because I had to say, yes, Your Honor, no, Your Honor, I'm sorry, Your Honor, and I'm never going to do that again, Your Honor. And I was about 15 years old, and my mom had placed what was called a PINS petition on me. Mm-hmm. It meant that I was mm. a person in need of supervision. I often say, make no mistake, I'm still today a person in need of supervision. <laughs> I'm just a little, bit, a little bit more <laughs> polished about it, right? And so... So in a nutshell, like I was that neighborhood kid. I, If you guys have talked about ACEs, I don't know if you've talked about ACEs here, but there are adverse childhood experiences. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I score a 10 out of 10, which mm-hmm. m- means ultimately I should be sitting anywhere other than here having this conversation. And I'm well aware of, uh, of what the trajectory of life could have been for somebody mm-hmm. like me. So I'm 15 years old. My mom places me on this PINS petition. The judge sentences me to hundreds of hours of community service. My school believes in me and my school lets me do some of that community service within the office of Mm. the school and here's what's key and this is what i will always start any presentation or any conversation with how i started here because i was in the school doing the community service and a community member came in she wasn't she didn't work for the school she didn't um you know hold a job by the school she was just somebody who literally cared about the neighborhood kid and she asked me to hang up 100 posters for this program called Hugs. And uh, I often say I didn't look anything like this. I had jeans that had lots of holes in them, not because I was trying to be fashionable and trendy, but because we were on public assistance. And mm-hmm. those jeans probably belonged to other people before they made it to my body. I had a Metallica t-shirt because I had no no rhythm, but I could bang my head out to heavy metal all day long. <laughs> I had a chain that went to a wallet with no money in it. But my whole energy wasn't about what I looked. My energy was about stay away from me. And I'm no good. And I was locked into my unworthy story. I was um, I was locked into telling people. Uh, I was going to joke and say people could call in if they yeah. wanted to and heckle me. But um, I hope that wasn't <laughs> they, one of them. I hope not. <laughs> so, um, I'll get a message if it was from a friend. <laughs> um, so, you know, so I was, I was so bought into this unworthy story about me. And I wanted to make everybody know, like, I, I had no value. I was, I was not worth it. Stay away from me. And for whatever reason, Mrs. Block saw right through all of that. Um, and Mrs. Block, you know, uh, Mrs. Block just believed in me and saw me bigger than I possibly could see myself. By the time I had hung up all these posters, I wanted nothing more than to go to this leadership conference. But it said the word leader. And I thought, for sure, that's not me. Mm. That's the good kids. That's the shiny kids. I'm the shiny kid. Kids. I'm the kid that the parents say, don't hang out with her. She's a mm. bad influence. Right. So so I get in front of Mrs. Block and she's like, you know, Kim, you should go. And I was like, all about my I can't story. I don't have the money to go. She said, I'll pay for you. I said, I don't have a way to get to Shelter Island. She goes, I'll get somebody to drive you to Shelter Island. Like, my mom's never going to let me go. She's like, I'll call your mom. And every time I said no, she saw me bigger than I possibly could see myself. A guidance counselor took me out. We drove out to the campsite. We get to the campsite. It's all the shiny kids. It's Mm. all the happy kids. It's all the kids that I just never knew how to be around. And I had the most incredible experience of oh my gosh, get me out of here. My skin is crawling and I'm home all in the same moment. And wow. because I never know when to leave a party, I'm now the executive director of that organization wow. many years later. That right? is yep. fascinating. So, yeah. So wow. I know I know firsthand the power. And, and here's the deal for me. For me, that wasn't enough for me to say at that moment, I'm going to put down substances Mm. in my life. I wasn't ready at that point. I will say, however, I did walk into a program of recovery when I I went once when I was 18 and then again um, started it consistently when I was 20. And I think I was able to find a program of recovery so much earlier because a seed was planted and I was given a, a glimmer of hope which were things that I had not experienced mm. up until that particular conference on Shelter Island. And we still run those weekends. Yeah, it's the highlight I, of the work the work that we do. And we always invite anybody to come on out and share in that experience. Wonderful. And, th- and th- a special thanks to Mrs. Block, is it? Mrs. Block, who's no longer with us, but um, oh. I have a beautiful connection with her son. And I tell him all the time, I share the story about her regularly. And, and if there's ever a time your neighborhood kid needs you, it's yeah. right yeah. now. Oh, yeah. And there's so many many opportunities just to instead of looking at them and saying you know what's wrong with kids today but look for what's right with kids today and start to really make some good connections with them because as we look to reconnect through covid this place of isolation that we have been in has had its impact 
on adults and very specifically kids Mm -hmm. and oftentimes people will say kim kids are resilient kids are resilient i know i hear that all the time and And they are to they are to an extent but how much of us right how much of us are still how much right and how many of us are still working at our childhood Mm -hmm. crap in our adult Mm -hmm. lives yeah so (laughs) as much as we all are resilient some of us have some some stuff Mm -hmm. that we're still dealing with today stuff Yeah. Right. Wow. What an amazing story. And, and I uh, love the way you said too that planting that seed might have resulted in you getting some help earlier on. And I think that that's so key now, especially with yeah. the way things are going, right. to plant those seeds in kids. And like you said, to look for not what they're doing wrong. What are you doing right? And try to focus on that right. as well. Yeah. Those weekends are. I mean, they're just. It's the, we've run a variety of programs for adults for kids. We're all over the place. But I will say. If you said to me, Kim, you can only pick one program that hugs facilitates, hands down, I'm always going to say Teen Institute. Mm. And and so what it looks like is we take 120 kids from all different walks of life, from all different schools across Long Island. So we have schools from out east. We have schools from up west. We have kids who are athletes. We have kids who are in student government. We have kids who don't feel that they fit into any particular How are, they, how are these kids school? selected? So it happens in a couple of ways, right? So um, so sometimes kids are selected because an adult says, hey, I know about this program. You're going to love it. You're going to go. And uh, and so those kids, uh, they they often blame their advisor for mm. mandating them. Right, Nobody's right. mandated yeah. to be there, right? <laughs> so, uh, but there's always, so sometimes it's a caring adult who says, hey, sometimes it's peer-to-peer. Kids come back to school on Monday cool. with this natural high, with this glow, with this energy. And oh. people are like, hey, what the heck yeah. is going on? Yeah. And they're like, I just had the most amazing experience, right? So we do a lot of um, power of attraction. We do a lot of, you know, talking with schools and getting schools to bring school groups out. What's key important to us, don't send me all your leaders. Because mm. if you train one kind of leader, you've trained one kind of leader. Mm-hmm. And I don't know about you guys, but if that happy perky person came up to me when I was in school and tried to influence change yeah. in my behavior, yeah. I would have told them to go take a hike, yep. right? So we need kids from all different walks walks of life, all different life experiences. And so they come together. And here's the cool thing. And people don't believe me when I tell them. So they show up on the campsite on Friday. It's youth led, youth youth empowered, youth run. So it's a whole group of kids who've been through our program trained to take the lead, the adult support. And we just kind of say, hey, we're here. Then um, on Friday, when they first get there, I have a big bucket and everybody turns in their cell phones. Oh, even better. And people better. are like, wait oh. a second, you take 120 kids away and mm-hmm. they don't have, they give up their cell phone for the weekend. And interestingly enough, sometimes they'll be like, give us a little resistance. Some kids have bought fake phones. And I mean, there's, there could be 10,000 stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yep. But it's the parents sometimes who have, like, they're texting me, like, I haven't seen my kid on so- in any of your social media posts. Are they doing okay? And kind of doing this helicopter parenting mm-hmm. uh, that, that can happen. But really, it's, um, it's kind of amazing. And by Saturday, nobody cares about yeah. their phones That's anymore. Awesome. And we bring wow. them through speakers who have lived experience. We bring them through speakers who have who are subject matter experts in whatever particular topics the kids want us talking about. And then they go and they break out into these small family groups where they really dive into the topics nice. that they learned about. How does it connect to them? How does it then impact people in their schools? And what can they do when they go back home to be an agent of change, of understanding, of empathy, and of empowerment to other students? students within their schools. And so these students wind up oftentimes going on to becoming RAs at college, cool. um, choosing the helping professions, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and all because of these empowering weekends, right? And how, how cool is it? You go yeah. away for a weekend and everybody loves on you for yep. like 48 hours. Like life is good. I know. Do you, and you have these for adults? or We don't have them for adults. Men, However, adults, right, I, I, I kind of want to yeah, go. You know. <laughs> well, so here's the cool thing is this, we are only as, as strong as our volunteer base. Yeah. And so we can take volunteers and there's a whole process to become a volunteer with us. But we need, my staff is small. We can't handle mm-hmm. all of them on our yeah, own. Right. And so, um, so adults very, uh, um, and, and oftentimes, go through some amazing and and adults say like 
I learn more than I think that I'm even right. teaching the kids. So, and people can find out about this on your website? Right, right on the Hugs Inc. website. Okay, yeah. great. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. You know, Hugs is um, national, right? Right. So, so there are, so the first, there's other teen institutes in different states, some which is super cool. Georgia, Illinois, New Jersey has one. We all kind of run a little autonomously, but we all have those similar threads of connectiveness and empowering youth. So on top of those other connections we have, I, I have this opportunity to train and travel across the country and speak in a variety of different states and really listen to what's happening out there, not just taking a look at what's going on in Long Island, but North Carolina, Arkansas. Um, I did a keynote in Virginia yesterday. I was in D.C. over the, you know, Monday, Tuesday. So uh, so we do get to kind of spread a little hugs all over the country wherever we go. Now, I just did I read correctly that hugs was closing not too long ago. Right. And you brought it back to life. So, I read that too. Right. So you read that. So that was probably 2002 is when. So, so I just, I just want to try to paint a little bit of a picture right. here as to the magnitude of this. <laughs> like, and we're saying national and not too long ago, right. we were not even. Yeah. So, so what happened in, so I took over the organization in September. 2002 as executive director i'm 35 years old i'm in like my first like 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 i gotta fly this plane and we lose all of our funding and i'm like oh my gosh this program that so many people relied on for years and we lose we lost all of our funding oh, now at the time we were only funded about eighty thousand dollars which sounds like a lot of money but when you had to pull off the programming we did that included salary that included rent that included everything and so um and I beg, borrowed, and stole. I did what I know how to do. I fought. I fought because it mattered. It mattered to them. It mattered to making a difference. And and I will say, I mean, what was at that point an eighty thousand dollar organization um, this year with the new funding we've just received will come close to a million dollars in oh funding. And wow! Went for, I know it's. I can't That's even incredible. like as I say yeah. this, That's I'm really just awesome. like whoa. Yeah. And, um, you know, where I when I first took over the organization, I literally made my boys share a bedroom. I made one of their bedrooms my office. Now we have a whole complex in West Hampton Beach. We've partnered with Thrive Recovery Centers. They've just moved out and and, um, share some of our building space where Mm -hmm. they can offer recovery supports on the East End. And so there's just this great movement that is happening um, in really a testament to need, a testament to um, the work that our volunteers have done for years. And it's really quite. It's quite special. And a testament to yourself. Don't sell yourself. Oh, yeah. I mean, (laughs) I remember when we spoke with you uh, a couple, a few months ago. um, One, one thing that, and Kurt and I always talk about this word that you shared with us, Mm. community health. Yeah. Mm. And that really stuck with us Mm -hmm. because it sounds like that's really what you're doing. Yeah. And it. When when we talk about substance use disorder, right? Oftentimes we talk about and we and people will talk about prevention. They they're like the kids just need to hear stories. And the truth is, it's about community health. It's it's not about. Um, it's this is not my quote, but I often get quoted saying this. We have to stop blaming the fish for dying after they swam in a polluted pond. Mm. It's our job to clean up the pond. We yeah. can't like legalize cannabis and legalize online gaming and have alcohol at every outlet from our gas stations to our delis to our grocery yeah. like everywhere and then say, Oh, why do we have an addiction problem? Mm. Right? So if we can improve community health. Um, and that's really the name of the game. There's seven strategies to community change, seven of them. Oftentimes, people and even my peers in the field, we just kind of stay focused on the district, getting information out there and building skills. Now, those two things have their value and they have their merit and they have their worth. And if we really want to talk about change, we have to roll up our sleeves, stop talking about the drug of the day, and get to the but why and but why here? Mm. Why is it in my community? Why why are we in it? Oftentimes, as much as we are so alarmed about fentanyl and the opiates, and we should be. But I remember when, you know, when when heroin, you know, when we went through the wave of prescription drugs and then we moved to the wave of um, of heroin and then we moved to the synthetics and Mm -hmm. now we're in the combination stage. Alcohol still kills just as many. Yeah. And if we don't talk about brain development, if we don't talk about delaying the onset for that brain, delaying access to the substances and changing community norms. 
you're just going to keep spending this time talking about the next big drug. And by the time we get everybody educated on the big scare that's on the street, there's another new, nitrazine is on the street oh, now, yeah, right? So we're always be a drug right. of the day. So there's yeah. o- we're always going to be in this. We have to get comprehensive about our approach, our strategies, mm-hmm. and implore all seven strategies of community change and bring together coalitions of people who want to really talk about how they can make their communities healthier. And it can't just be one agency trying yeah. to push that change. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, you know what? Obviously, it starts in the home, mm-hmm. uh, of course. Um, I was reading an article that you were um, interviewed in by the Long Island Post pulse that was a while ago and but what you said it was fascinating um i'm just i'm going to quote you on here it is important that families have their own personal policy based on science and the law this means no alcohol under the age of 21 this is what i like what you said we encourage parents to set up text codes with their kids if a kid goes to a party and there's alcohol or the kid feels uncomfortable all they need to do is text some kind of code or the Mm -hmm. letter x and their parents will know what that means, and it will give the kid an, a kind of an easy out um, to not be embarrassed or whatever. Right. But uh, I, I, I found that really sa- mm-hmm. it's so simple; it almost sounds like no brainer. But but we don't. And you're in that stage where you know parents are like, I'm never going to let you know. It starts in seventh and eighth and ninth grade. I'm never letting my kid go to a party where there's alcohol, right? Mm-hmm. And they're pretty clear on that. We need to empower parents to go back to being uncomfortable and talking to other parents to finding out what's going to happen at your house when my kids are over there, right? No parents are smart enough to know that they'll, they're they liable if they host a party of underage drinking, not only from the social host law, but oftentimes it's not just the party where there's alcohol. It's the people who hook up with one another. It's mm. the fights that break out. Mm-hmm. It's all those other things too, um, other than that. And so, so we tend to, by the time your kid's in like 10th grade, a lot of times parents don't want to be the parent to say oh no well, you can't go to the party i don't party. even know if it's that late mm-hmm. right like, frankly that's true. like yeah, i really don't you know and i think with tech the way technology is nowadays and I, I really feel like kids are kind of off on their own a lot more and with a lot and less younger supervision now. and younger as well Much and 12 yeah, when you're yeah. at one of these parties i just feel like you don't know who's there right and yeah there, there's this you know there's this fear of I don't want my kid doing the hard stuff. Mm. So if he just drinks, that's kind of okay. Oh. And or I just drink and I went on yeah. there and we'll keep them safe. And mm-hmm. we did a beautiful job with the drinking and driving laws that we got. But what we didn't think about was how that was just going to create bars and nightclubs in families' basements yeah. for everybody to kind of hang out. Yeah. And it is an area that that parents have to double down in mm-hmm. it's just building those skills for them mm-hmm. and that uncomfortability because nobody wants to be that parent and right. yeah. um but until but we you don't st- want to be right that parent you know right. yeah and you can't be friends with your kids either mm-hmm. uh, it's something i see so often and i I, yeah. I cringe when, you know. Well, yeah, and the truth, like if you ask my boys who they were more afraid of, the guy who carried a gun because my husband was a police officer, or me, <laughs> they will tell you hands down it was always me. And I will say they're still my friends, but my job, parenting is a verb, and it's not easy to do. No, it is so so hard, and you question yourself. At I question myself at every single thing I did. You know, as I raised them. You know, in what what helped me in raising my sons with this was the conversation about physical health. Mm. My kids were football players. Mm. One night of drinking takes away two two weeks peak performance training time. One night of drinking, you're twice as likely to sustain an injury the next day out on the field. Wow. Right? It reduces one night of drinking your hormones to help your body heal reduced by 14 percent so when you start talking to athletes and you start giving them wait a second this isn't just about moral this isn't just about illegal this is about physically what alcohol does to my body and i can actually perform better if i don't put substances in my body that was a game changer for them and that's why family policy becomes it's not just about telling your kids not to use alcohol it's about showing them that you're willing to do the same have one party a year without alcohol there show them that they can have fun without alcohol Mm -hmm. you tell them show them model that behavior when you're stressed out after a long day don't be like i i just have to have a beer i have to have a glass of wine show them go for a walk talk about your feelings identify what that feeling is shake it off in so many different ways and the name of this game all around is building our emotional intelligence and as much as we want to talk about our 
our, our IQ, as much as we want to talk about building our physique, we have to strengthen our conversation about emotional intelligence. Well put. Wow, amazing, Kim. I, you, uh, you're, you must be very proud of your boys, and I'm sure they're very proud of just you too. Just a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much. This goes kind of quickly, so we're just about to have a mid wrap here. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, so tune on to our show every other Friday on WSB.FM from 1 to 2 p.m. By now, almost everyone knows someone who has died of this cause. We must remember that these deaths are preventable. Each one of us has the power to make a difference. People, talk to your kids. Talk to the people you, lo- you love. Your words and support can be life-changing. It may be the c- most crucial discussion you'll ever have with them. So... I'm, we're going to play a song for you, Kim. Oh. Okay, because uh, you're pretty and ama- you're an amazing woman, and what you're doing for our community is awesome. So here is Alicia Keys, "Girl on Fire" for you, Kim. We will be right back with Kim Lauby, Executive Director of Hugs. You are listening to WSB Stony Brook, ninety point one and one hundred seven point three FM. We'll be right back. She's just a girl, and she's on fire. Hotter than a fantasy, lonely like a highway. She's living in a world and it's on fire. Filled with catastrophe.
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Allison of Play It Forward. We are here with Kim Lauby, Executive Director of Hugs. Welcome back, Kim. <laughs> so glad to be here. Yeah, we, we're, we're very happy you're here with us today. So why don't we pick up where we left off? Where were we, Kurt? Um, I think that we were going to jump into maybe a little segment about stigma. Yeah, Ooh, right. A big mm. one. So here's the here's the thing. You know, when we talk about when we when we talk about numbers, right? It's said that ninety percent of anybody who has an addiction doesn't get help for it, mm. right? That, so ninety percent of the people who qualify for substance use disorder diagnoses does not get help. Now immediately a lot of people will say stigma is the reason and stigma is not alone the reason access to affordable treatment and care on demand is a major major piece of it but there is a lot of stigma there's stigma for the helpers who want to get help but don't know who to call because if you're working in the field how could you right. you know be somebody to reach out we see this also you know with law enforcement and our first responders um, anybody who has those kind of helping positions it's really difficult but stigma when it comes to substance use disorder plays out in a lot of ways and a lot of times it plays out even in our own language that we use and so that's why years ago we switched. We say substance use disorder or we say substance misuse as opposed to substance abuse. We want to move it away from the individual, right? We want to make sure that we're not we're not adding blame. We do the same on the mental health side when we talk about we use the term death by suicide. Um, and if we're in this field, those are that's the those are the terms we're supposed to use in order to stop blaming the individuals to yeah. stop pointing the finger and in, in, in adding shame mm -hmm. to the conversation. We ask um, people as they, you know, as people talk amongst themselves in their own recovery supports, oftentimes that is a, a little different. But when we're portraying ourselves to the outside world, we want to not use the term clean. I know that that's one oftentimes. Um, and, and even people who I love and respect, I watch them on a microphone and I hear them say clean. And here's the problem. We weren't dirty. Ooh. You know, yeah. and we were individuals who had a disease. And so if we look at any of the other diseases out there, we won't use the same terminology yeah. and language that we use on our own. And so, wow. so really, when we look at how do we break down stigma, some of the easiest ways is to one stop using the term clean um and uh and that's a huge one right um to say in recovery because that's what we are and um and so and then the other pieces are just really kind of fall in place right you didn't have a dirty urine i know that that's um, when people talk about yeah. right yeah. so so there are just these minor these little tiny shifts but tiny shifts make big waves right yeah. like these little ripples can build into big waves and and it is incumbent upon anybody who has a microphone who's talking about this to really do some work and get educated yeah i will say um one of our programs is the long island addiction resource center which um is uh, if you go to long island addiction center um i think it's uh, dot org uh it has all the prevention treatment harm reduction um resources in both nassau and suffolk counties and then it has on there um on the website is a sheet that says say this don't say that and we have handouts oh, cool. that we can offer to people i think magnets too um, but it's really becomes important that as as we begin to create some awareness and change and call for action, we got to be on our best game to do so too. And really helping reducing stigma by just choosing different words in our language makes makes a big, big, big um, change. Have you seen any improvement in this area though over the years? Yeah, so we're starting to see some of that, right? So, so it's still we're still kind of. You know, in this place where we, we did really great at saying it's okay to not be okay, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Now we have to say, but then what? Okay. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Like when, like, okay, so I said I'm not okay, but yeah. now what where, am I? <laughs> where, right. And yeah. where am I going to go? Mm -hmm. Who am I going to talk to? Right. So we did see, we saw the shift in people saying, oh, you know, and and SUD and mental health are not separate things. Oftentimes we want to talk about them as separate things, right? Where they're it's, not. They're I not. Know. And they're so complicatedly twisted together that yeah mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely and so you know and we see this happening a lot a young person has you know adhd or you know starts using 
um, smoking uh, cannabis to, you know, as a way to kind of get that under control. But for, you know, loses control with that, is not able to, you know, to manage, um, you know, the thing they were using to manage symptoms of one thing has created uh, mm-hmm. problems in other areas of life. Um, you know, again, the, the name, and I'll go back to this point we said in the first segment, um, we have to stop giving permission for young developing brains to use substances um, because they're not fully developed or hardwired oh, until yeah. an average age of 25. An average age, that's another thing. When that, their frontal lobe is Right, developed. when their frontal lobe. And oftentimes I hear people say at 25, it's not a switch, it's not a magical day <laughs> yeah, like, on your birthday. <laughs> my brain is working today. And so you have to kind of know the individual to know which part of the average they fall upon. But the easiest, simplest way to understand this is the brain, the back part of the brain is where growth starts and the great brain in early adolescence grows from the back to the front the back part of the brain you love how i'm using my hands like people can see me using my hands to explain this um, the back part of the brain is like this gas pedal that says go it's going to be epic it's going to be awesome we should do this and the front part of the brain says oh maybe we shouldn't maybe we could get hurt and it thinks consequentially the yeah. problem is is the back part doesn't doesn't catch fully up. catch up until an average age of 25 and the brain will grow shrink grow shrink grow shrink as it does this neuro pruning process wow. until it gets to the front and when we start to put chemicals in there and we start to use those different substances we actually are changing what's going on with the brain now not every person under the age of 25 who picks up a substance will become addicted to it, right? We know that 10% of the population has substance use disorder, 10%. We know that 90% of that 10% all started in their teen years. Wow. 90% of anybody who has a substance use disorder began using in their teenage years. That fact right there if i said 90 percent of the people who have diabetes all mm. ate sugar in their teen years that's huge. we would go to the end of the earth to make sure that nobody under the age of 25 touched a twinkie a tootsie roll or cotton candy right yeah. we know the science about substance use disorder and unfortunately we in our minds make it about a social issue and not about a health issue right. and unfortunately when we when we do that we start to give permission for it we have a low perceived risk of how bad it's really going to impact us and we don't think it causes harm wow that that's amazing information yeah Kim. i mean i really hope that uh a lot of under 25 year olds are listening right now you know um but yeah it's 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 stigma is um a big deal um i what you were saying about words are quite powerful right you know and uh i think that's great that you're you're really spearheading right. that in the right direction and the other piece that's really hard for people is if they choose not to drink and there was there's been a big movement after covid for people who are just making a decision not to drink and they say they have get as much pressure on them as adults like why are you not having a drink? Come on, wait a second. Is, uh, did something go wrong during COVID? And they're like, no, we're just from a health perspective, choosing not to put alcohol into our system. So we almost don't know what to do with people when they make an active choice. And so we've got to make, we've got to make that trendy and cool and support it at every level that we possibly can in normalizing just people not drinking. Right. Like, let's yeah. just like, you know, let's just call that like, that's just a good thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I early in recovery, I mean that I went to uh, went to my buddy's wedding and that mm. was it was such a startling thing for everybody there. Like, why aren't you drinking? Why aren't you drinking? Why aren't you why don't you have a drink? And you know, I was very early on, I didn't want to get into the whole thing, but uh even now if someone close to me stopped drinking and uh are constantly asked, you know, and no, I just stopped drinking, I just don't want to drink, I just well, why? You know, what's the what's the matter? You know, <laughs> yeah. well, nothing. I, <laughs> no, what's the matter just, with you? <laughs> it's just a health yeah, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. One one year when I went out on social media, and I it was it was my recovery anniversary, and I I think it was thirty years, and I was like thirty oh, wow. years, like how cool is this? And the amount of people who actually said congratulations, but then put like the emoji of the champagne bottle and oh, the that's glasses, so interesting. but we don't mm-hmm. even think of how like again, it's right down to right. Yourself celebratory happy so i challenge adults to say every time you're tempted to do that just put a pot leaf and they're like huh Mm. i would never put a pot leaf 
pot's just as legal as yeah. alcohol right yeah. now. Yep. So why wouldn't, you know, and so really getting people to drill down on, oh, we have this idea that the only way we can celebrate is by, I'll take flowers, I'll take chocolate, I don't need, you know, like, yeah. there's so many different ways to, you know, I'll take a smiley face and a heart, you know. Um, keep the alcohol bo- emojis yeah, off my Facebook. Yeah, wow, yeah. Wow. That's that is true. I that is something very common, especially like people getting married. You see the champagne mm-hmm. and the champagne glasses. And, yeah. Wow. I just want to take a quick moment to kind of interrupt what we were talking about and go. Um, I want to talk about what we're going to be doing this weekend: the Play It Forward project. Oh yeah. Um, and we will be going down to Washington D.C. Uh, to Union Square for the Trail of Truth. What is the Trail of Truth, you might ask? Uh, the Trail of Truth is an artistic event with a powerful purpose to memorialize our loved ones lost to substance use related causes while using the magnitude of our collective loss to create change. The event includes art installations of the National Memorial Cemetery, healing opportunities, speakers, singers, a live performance art piece, including the family members, um, and a march to demand immediate access to treatment and an end and the end of de- discrimination in medical care. Uh, and so we will be traveling down to D.C. bright and early tomorrow morning yep. and participating um, and supporting and honoring those that have lost are- their lives. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be and there the family with members them. that are still carrying on. A lot of people. Uh, yeah. Claudia Frizzell from Fist and Lori Carbonero, yeah. and Carol, Carol Trottier, Trottier, Steve Chasman of Lycan. Yeah, yeah um, in fact, Lori and um, Claudia were on our show about a month ago, mm-hmm. and they were talking about how the tombstones that are mm. that are being going to be displayed. Yeah, I saw them when I was at the Mobilized Recovery on on Monday. Oh, that they you? had the tombstones there, and it's quite. And I, um, yeah, it's going to be a powerful. It's powerful, powerful and experience. impactful. Mm-hmm. And well, Allison, do you want to maybe share a little bit? Um, yeah, I, um, I, I, I made one for my brother, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I'm going to be honoring him tomorrow, along with um, other family members who have been affected by this. Um, it's going to be a really important day, and mm-hmm. I really, I really hope people are going to pay attention and mm-hmm. and and listen because, you know. It, you don't want to wait till it's too late, you know. You, you, and and parents that say, "Oh, not my kid," that you gotta, you gotta. Everyone has to pay attention. Yeah. And just like Kim was saying, like, well, the the pond is is polluted. Yeah. You know, so it's our job as a community to mm-hmm. to clean the pond, right? right. Wow. Um, yeah, tomorrow's going to be a big it day. Is. So I hate that it's going to rain. But anybody is uh, <laughs> listening and they're in the D.C. area or they'll be traveling, um, it begins at 11 a.m. That's Memorial Cemetery opens. Um, there are healing opportunities from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. There are speakers and performers from 3:30 till about five, and then we march um, on the Health and Human Services and the Department of Labor at 5:30. Uh, so if anybody is uh, going to be attending, keep an eye out for the Play It Forward project. We'll keep an eye out for you and uh, see everybody down there. Yeah, we're going to live stream some of the yeah. event for sure. And um, yeah, it's going to be uh, very powerful. It should be. Don't you just love that Lori and Claudia? Oh, my gosh. Like, they're just the best of the yep. best. They are. Little the, firecrackers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can't stop them. And they give the best hugs. They which do. I they appreciate do. as oh, the director They're of big, hug, big yes. huggers. Yeah, I know. They're, yeah. they're great people. And, uh, yeah, Lori um, and Claudia, uh, they they are just doing so much work mm-hmm. for this cause. And uh, I've really come to, to love, the, love these ladies. Yes. Um, so, Kim, do you guys have any upcoming events or anything that um, – You'd like to talk about? Sure. So I would encourage folks. I mean, we have a variety of programs always in operations. We tend to be in a lot of school districts, especially because October is um, is Red Ribbon Week, um, which is just Red Ribbon came off my tongue very easy. It doesn't always do that. Uh, but that's where we raise awareness in a lot of the elementary schools and middle schools and high schools about, um, you know, just bringing substance misuse right up to the to the forefront. If you're driving around the East End, here's uh, just two fun things 
Flanders for Recovery Month. The Big Duck in Flanders yes. is lit up purple for Recovery Month. All we right. were able to make yeah. that happen. Very and, cool. Um, and then if you go out further on the east end to Sag Harbor, the historic windmill right in downtown Sag Harbor is lit up purple. Oh, this wow. is, I think, our fourth year of doing That's that. That's nice. now. Yeah, nice. it's just a great, uh, we have a nice little program in uh, Sag Harbor called Safe in Sag Harbor where we've just worked um, there for years and that has been one of our favorite projects very cool. There, um, I would encourage anybody who is interested in our teen institutes. Those do start up in the spring. However, training for our adult volunteers, training for our youth starts quite uh, quite soon. Okay. So, uh, so great get, opportunities that you, yeah. your organization mm-hmm. offers. And people, did you hear it's in West Hampton? It's in West <laughs> Hampton. That's right. Yeah, right. Great and, location you right. got there. Yeah. So, uh, but you can come find us. There's so many different events we're tabling. So many different partnerships we are yeah. in. We're kind of um, a little all over over the place and we love it that's we'll, good we'll have some folks at sunshine i was just up. gonna say oh, there yeah. will be at sunshine prevention yeah. center yeah and we're as many we're out have been as, as many recovery walks and different things that we possibly can mm-hmm. uh just uh, as of the last month in particularly well we will be going to the recovery wa- walk uh next saturday on the 30th in massapequa and we'll be posting that on our social media if you're interested in joining us fantastic a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on um but, you know, you, so we were talking about the Trail of Truth, which is happening tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Why don't you share with the listeners about Mobilize Recovery? Oh, oh, that's a great one. What an honor that was. Um, so Mobilize Recovery has been around for a few years, and it's um, and it's spearheaded, I believe, Ryan Hampton is the founder um He's not alone in that, but the movement is going all across the country, raising awareness that people can and do recovery and recover, and they do it out loud. And so, um, this year was the first year it came back to DC. I think the last couple of years they've actually, during COVID, have taken it across the country mm. on a bus. Um, so this one, a few of us were invited to do some spoken word, to do some storytelling. It was a national contest where uh, people had to apply, and they went from you know. Uh, Hundred uh, applications, and they chose the top eight. Wow. I was fortunate enough; they wanted a middle-aged person, and so I made it to the stage with wow. uh, with the young storytellers. There were eight of us in total on Monday night. Um, the energy in the room was fabulous, and just the whole energy, like being around that conference, um, just feeling. You know, these were people who were coming and just pro recovery, pro yeah. supporting mm-hmm. one another, and pro making a you know a big difference in. And I know Wednesday they were at the White House testifying and sharing their stories with with people. I mean, there were so many different workshops and events. Um, but that one on Monday night was listening to the other seven speakers and myself included, but really listening to them and their journey of all the different things we've all walked through to stand where we stand today. Uh-huh. And um, and every one of them, you could hear their story and be like, I don't know that I could have walked through that. I, you know, and then they hear your story and they're like, the I don't know if I could walk through really that, incredible. right? Yeah. So it's really, it was such a beautiful, and that is just the start. I was so, so excited to work with SAMHSA on that project. And we believe that um, that's this was just the beginning. We're going to see a lot more wow. things. But mobilized recovery is definitely a great cause to get behind. And there were folks there from Trail of Truth. It's really kind of this week long. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm looking at um, all the um, the breakout sessions yeah. that they had. I, it's a huge it's long right list. There. And Macklemore was there yeah. and taking your picture. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so how cool was that? Like they were like Macklemore's in the audience, and I'm like, and and I thought for sure because I was the last speaker, he wasn't going to stay. And I get up to speak, and I see Macklemore with his camera taking a picture of me, and I was like, oh my gosh! And I was trying to like act all like cool, you know. But I was like, and and yet I wanted to like break out into you know thrift shop and let him know <laughs> that I'm hip and I know the music that he sings. And so, um, but yeah, and then he came up after the after it and he was just so gracious and so he he loved what that night meant and the stories that he heard he loved it so much that when he was on a panel the next day he talked about us as storytellers really? the night before so it was really um it left it, it left an impact he could identify with us Maybe and, that's, and that's it. It. you know what it doesn't matter where those right. people where we wind up it doesn't matter how high we get in in life or whatever uh we all we all know what that 
feels like. That's and, it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, Joe Green, who uh, is, I encourage people to find him. He uh, has some great projects out there. He's all about the spoken word. He was our coach throughout the thing. But, you know, he got up there and he said, you know, he knows the value of being able to see a sunrise today. Mm. Right. Wow. And and not everybody gets that. I think maybe he said sunset, the beauty in a sunset. Yeah. But for many of us for so long we just lived in a way we didn't see feel or touch things and when you're given this opportunity to recover things are brighter they smell better they're They're just beautiful they're just more beautiful and uh what a beautiful journey we get to walk never be as bad as it was right now that's can you can you explain a little bit what spoken word is so i um so this was really using storytelling to take specific moments to um, just, you know, we all could tell our, our war story. We all could tell like what it was, but this opportunity to just take one or two stories and talk about um, and, and share it in a way that the audience can feel it, that they know exactly what the emotion was behind that, that they can connect to it away in identifying with their own personal story. I, I'll tell you in, for mine I shared very much the same story I shared about Mrs. Black and how I walked into this and then I went on to share the second part of this um, which is when I had an opportunity to be on Anderson Cooper Mm. and uh, and I had my son sit in his dorm room and I had his football team I'm like have your football team come and watch me I'm going to be on Anderson Cooper and I thought like this was a good way to like educate without educating and uh, and the the fast forward was in all the ways that Anderson Cooper could have acknowledged me. He only said they said that I was an addict underneath my name, and so it nice. created this moment where not everybody, my mm. son realized because all of a sudden somebody yelled out, "Hey." I didn't know your mom was an addict. Mm. And for the first time, my son realized not everybody saw us in that positive, healthy light of like in our resilience stories, just with all that heavy Mm -hmm. stigma. So it's a great opportunity to to share that and and add that as part of my story. That's incredible. Yeah, it's really, uh, really powerful. We, you know, we're very much aligned with your, you know, your organization's um, mission and vision. And we... We strongly believe um, peer-to-peer advocacy is really a key component mm-hmm. to, to getting more done and, and, and really trying to, to help our community's health, mm-hmm. right? And so, uh, so we have an idea of, um, you know, we're, we're trying to put together a mobile podcast mm-hmm. that we will be giving kids a voice Love to it. speak on the subject. And, you know, going to... Uh, um, out having outdoor assemblies mm-hmm. and interactive demonstrations. I, you know, I, a lot of what you do, uh, especially at Shelter Island, love mm-hmm. to see that in mm-hmm. action because that's what we're envisioning. Because I realize, you know, I've been a teacher for many years, and right. when you work with y- young people, they have so many great ideas, and they know each other way mm-hmm. better sometimes than we think we know them. Mm-hmm. And well, and back to your point too, Kim, of planting the seed. You know, having a kid come up and you say, "Hey, what does it? What does addiction mean to you? What does you know uh, substance use disorder mean to you?" Mm-hmm. And you just get them talking about it, and you don't know what that sparks in their head or what conversations that sparks with their friends and stuff. Right. And it's workforce development. It's not just mm-hmm. about that too. It's about getting people excited about this work early on that they choose careers right. in it. Yeah, right. right. Ap- yeah. yeah, and, and you don't are... wait till they're twelve or fourteen. Mm-hmm. Right. And we're we're talking about youth all over Long Island. So mm-hmm. however that yeah. works, you know, we would love to to join in. And I know some of our students would love to come and share their thoughts or have you or share their thoughts with you whether here or there mm. yeah we um, want to hear pretty powerful I, their voices need to be yeah. heard and you know we um we also want to want to take it a step further by appointing youth ambassadors to each school where mm. you know they continue the advocacy mm. i i really strongly feel when you put especially young kids in charge of something mm. greater than themselves it gives them such purpose it teaches them that, wow, I can actually do this. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm good at this. They're good at it. Teaches them the, mm-hmm. teaches them empathy. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. is huge, right? And and let's get all the words right, people. You yeah. know, to right. uh to erase the stigma. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh so good we're stuff. gonna be wrapping up in a few minutes, but I, I just I, I just wanna say you're I'm, you're amazing. The work that you're doing is amazing. You're doing God's work and Don't thank stop. you. 
Keep yeah. it up. Appreciate yeah. you. I know. <laughs> Very much. I, I often say I don't know what I would do if I didn't do this work because I right. just, yeah. like, we we have our unwritten mission of hugs is just to make the space better. There you like, go. just make, yeah. wherever you go, make the space better and leave it better than when you got here. Mm-hmm. And that's, um, we do it in big ways and we do it in small ways. That is a very simple yet profound uh, mm-hmm. little motto I think everybody should consider make, make the space their better, lives. right yeah, like you know? we all can yeah. do one thing to be of contribution yeah. in the spaces we're at like mm-hmm. let's just bring our best self to mm-hmm. it well thank you so much kim yeah thank really you thank you very much yeah. for your work and uh and for hour you know goes by fast. the hum- community health that you are teaching everyone yeah, um, so i sincerely thank everyone who supports this cause and understands how important it is to look out for each other and to empathize with anyone you know dealing with addiction and struggling with substance misuse. Uh, Please educate one another about illicit fentanyl and various harm reduction measures such as Narcan and fentanyl test strips. Uh, We have ample support from various community-based groups, including AA, Narcotics Anonymous, Smart Recovery, Professional Treatment Programs, Case Management Services, and more. Reach out to us via Instagram at sbu.playitforward for more recommendations. Struggling with mental health or substance use? You're not alone. Reach out to SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP. SAMHSA also has a 24-7 info service at one 800 487-4889. For additional help, visit Hope House Ministries online at hhm.org or call 631-928-2377. And LICAD, the Long Island Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, offers support and guidance at 631-979-1700. And you can find more information at LICAD.org. On behalf of Play It Forward, thank you all for listening. We invite you today to join us on Instagram to see behind-the-scenes content, ask us questions, and to share your thoughts and ideas, and to be part of our dynamic, growing community. We hope to hear from you. Our Instagram is sbu.playitforward and YouTube, the Play It Forward Project. We hope that our message reaches somebody, so for now and always, keep keep playing playing it forward. Thank you, Taylor. And I believe you have a little announcement to make. Taylor? Shout out to Dory. Dory and my mom. It's both their birthdays today. And also shout out to Save a Pet in Port Jeff Station. Yes. Oh, and happy it's also my birthday. Cousin's birthday, Laura and in Utah. Cousin so. Laura in Utah. <laughs> so happy birthday, everybody. Happy birthday. Have a great weekend. Uh, check Stay us dry. out on t- Trail of Truth. Tr- yeah, Trail, Trail of, Truth. of Truth. You got it. Um, and j- don't forget about Sunshine Preventers. Prevention Center's Fall Festival on August 14th. So this is Allison of the Play It Forward Project, and I hope you tune in to our next show with advocate extraordinaires Carol Trottier, Claudia Frizzell, and Lori Carbonero on September 29th. We'll be on next week from 1 to 2 p.m. So thank you again, WSB, Tyrone, Matt, Jada, Sanjana, and Serena, and my co-hosts, Taylor and Kurt. So we have a special song that we, that, well, Kim actually requested. Uh, do you want to introduce this song, Kim? Sure. So uh, when we close out our conferences on Shelter Island, we have 120 kids sitting listening to this very song, um, challenging them to imagine the world a better place. And we're all part of that, making that happen. Awesome. Very cool. So Thank the you, Kim. closing song is Jack Johnson's cover of Imagine. You are listening to WSB Stony Brook 90.1 and 107.3 FM. Be well, everyone, and please look out for one another. Imagine there's no heaven It's easy if you try No hell below us And above us is only sky Imagine all the people Living for today you, you may say that I'm a dreamer 
But I'm not the only one I hope someday you'll join us And the world will live as one Imagine there's no countries It isn't hard to do Nothing to kill or die for No religion to Imagine all the people Living life for peace You And you may say that I'm a dreamer But I'm not the only one I hope someday you'll join us And the world will live as one